Trigger warning, this podcast episode 179 discusses and references eating disorders and self-harm. Some people may find this triggering. If this causes you distress, please seek support and contact Lifeline Australia on 13 11 14 or Kids Helpline on 1800 551 800 or Butterfly National Helpline on 1800 33 4673 or in a crisis or emergency, please contact your nearest hospital. Hi everyone, it's Eve Edley Blowitz from spiritgirl.com and welcome to Feel Good From Within. I'm super excited to be here with you today and with our very special guest, Katie Beecher, who is a licensed professional counsellor and medical and emotional intuitive with over 30 years experience. She is featured in Goop, Courtney Kardashian's website Posh, and Miranda Kerr's Cora Organics blog. She is also the author of Heal From Within, a guidebook to intuitive wellness. Katie Beecher, welcome. How are you today? I am great. Thank you so much for having me from your beautiful country that I love so much. Well, I'm so excited to have you here with us today, and I'll welcome our global audience and listeners right around the world I'm so grateful that we get to spend time with you today to learn more about how we can heal from within. Katie, before we dive into your book, are you happy to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? I'm medical, emotional, intuitive, been a counselor and an intuitive for over 30 years. And I work with people in a pretty unique way. I get a name and an age and that's it. I don't see a picture or anything. And I create a very extensive report with tons of personal details. And then I create an intuitive soul painting as well out of watercolor. And I send those before we meet. We go over all the information and it's literally everything about you that's impacting your life. So obviously physical and emotional health and career, and it could be like trauma and childhood stuff and relationships because everything impacts us. So my guides bring it all out. And then we look at some of the root causes for issues that people are having and what they want to work on. And we do problem solving and it's a pretty complete thing. So that is the way that I work. I didn't know I could do this until like 10 years ago. I always worked intuitively, but didn't know I had these gifts. So it's never too late to start a new career and find your life path, basically. And how did you discover your own intuitive gifts? That is a good question. So from a very, very young age, I always knew that I was picking up on people's thoughts and feelings and I felt a lot of energy, especially negative energy. Unfortunately, my family was not the healthiest. I knew there was more there. I knew I was getting information from somewhere I didn't know what it was at the time. And it was kind of scary actually, because it, like when you pick up negative energy, and you're a little kid, you really don't know what to do with that. I didn't have anyone I could talk to about any of this stuff. And then it really all came to a head when I was 16 and I developed a pretty serious eating disorder. And I knew that either I was going to get better or I was going to take my life. And I called our pediatrician. I didn't tell anyone and asked for help. Started to go to therapy with a Jungian counselor by myself. Had a car and a job, so I just went. And fortunately, that therapist helped me to, first of all, acknowledge that I was having these like visions and these conversations with these people from the other side and that picking up energy that you don't know if it's real or not, but it's real and helped me to kind of understand all of it and not fear it. And also helped me to get to know myself, my true authentic self, because when you have any addiction, you're just pushing yourself and your feelings down. So she helped me get to know me, help me find self-love, help me connect to my intuition, help me heal, and just kind of took it from there. And I became a therapist and started channeling people's relatives accidentally, which was very weird. Some of it was by accident, and some of it was just something I always kind of knew that I had that I've worked on developing. Wow. And you must have been so intuitive at that very young age to even seek outside support and get counseling because 
you were only 16 at the time right. and even to do that on your own is a mammoth effort because most 16 year olds today might seek the help from their parents you did that independently with all of the work that you did on yourself what did you feel was the underlying root cause sure. and i do feel like me getting help was divine intervention because it kind of just happened after trying a lot of other things myself and having it not work it was definitely underneath it all it was not knowing who i was not having any real sense of identity or self-acceptance or self-love and not having any kind of connection to a higher self or a higher power for direction anything i felt was overwhelming and i pushed it down and then feelings that get pushed down have to come out when i talk about that what my guides told me when i was 16 was with connection to intuition self-love and self-acceptance you can heal from anything and I say that sometimes and people are like, well, what about, you know, the physical symptoms? What about? And I'm like, it's the same deal. It's the same thing. And I'm not pushing away the physical symptoms or the emotional symptoms. They're all real. But I really believe that spirit and our intuition talk to us through the things that happen in our life and through our symptoms and they get our attention. And if we're not connected and not taking care of ourselves, which you need, and that's part of the self-love and self-acceptance then it's almost impossible to heal from anything. You're not going to get better. And it's not pretending that the physical stuff doesn't exist. And Katie, for anyone who's tuning in and maybe they're struggling with, say, their body image right now because social media is sharing all of these ideals of if you want to fit in, we have brands, as an example, who pick particular body shapes or sizes or ages and they're marketing that and we're being bombarded as women and even men would be yeah. getting bombarded too right. but with these particular body shapes or size and then it can be very difficult for a girl or a woman who feels like oh I don't look like that and then I'm hearing that there's been a rise of eating disorders and a lot of it's stemming from we're living in a time where we have, as an example, Instagram, which is a very photo-based yes, product. And it's got so many modelling photos. What would your advice be to a woman or a girl or a guy tuning in? First of all, I'd say grab, heal from within <laughs> and read the book because that will definitely help because you share your own personal journey there. My first piece of advice would be to get off of the internet and look around, look at everybody's bodies, not to compare yourself, but to see that we all have different body shapes and body types and that there are people who maybe put on more muscle than other, I happen to be one of those people who are shorter, who are taller, we all are different. And also remember that there is such a thing called auto-tune and it's rampantly used online and Instagram. And it's like, if any of these people who look so perfect, like if you saw them when they wake up in the morning or in daily life, or they go to the bathroom the same way we do, maybe they, they weigh something different or maybe they don't. And it's just a camera tool. Like a good example, I do pole dancing. I'm a very avid pole fitness person. And you have to have muscle to do this. You have to be strong. You have to do all this stuff. And so I weigh like 10 pounds more than what my ideal would have been. And it's muscle and my clothes get bigger as I work out. And a long time ago, that would have really screwed with my head. And now it's like, because I like what I do so much, it's totally changed how I look at things. So find something that you love, find movement that you love. I don't say it would have to go to the gym now because I have to lose weight or because I won't all gain weight or whatever. Movement because you love it and try to have a loving relationship with your body. Send it good messages instead of just being like, oh crap, I have cellulite. I mean, we all do. Find something that you like about yourself to point out instead. It's a journey. It definitely is. There's a lot of body dysmorphia. All mirrors are different. Who knows if that's how you look in that mirror. You just try to be as loving, as kind to yourself as possible. I love those words of wisdom. Try to be as kind and loving to yourself as possible. Also do movement that you love. I've seen something on TikTok where 
a body positivity activist has showed this app where even on video now, she could be a particular size and then cut yep. her size by four or five. I didn't even know these apps existed. It's crazy. It's really dangerous too. It's not the real world. And I find, Katie, have you found this? As human beings, we don't compare our spirits. So I don't go online and go, oh, my spirit is smaller than her spirit or my spirit is bigger than her spirit. I've always found this profoundly interesting that we must have been programmed from a very young age about yeah. comparing ourselves in beauty with body and image. Absolutely. And I often wondered if we got taught from that ripe young age, you can't compare a spirit. I feel that we're still lacking some I love that. There. I love that. It's all about the external or how much money you make, which is also external. What's inside is really, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it, it really is what matters. I'm not going to be friends with someone because they look a certain way. I'm going to mm. be friendly with them. I want to hang out with them because they're a nice person and kind. The appearance is really secondary. And I think that, especially with the work I do, I've noticed people are really afraid to be themselves and get to know themselves because they think that if people actually got to know them and saw their flaws, that they wouldn't like them anymore. Or if mm. they spoke up for themselves, suddenly people wouldn't like them anymore. And that could be true, but those people who are just around you because of your fakeness aren't people you really want around you anyway. With your book, Heal From Within, what is the meaning behind the book title? It really goes back to what my guides told me. They told me at 16, I'd be writing this book. And it really is about coming from whether it's physical, spiritual, or emotional root causes, you have to get under all this stuff. I just did a post the other day about inflammation. And inflammation, people think is a root cause, but it's not. It's a symptom. So it's about getting underneath all of the stuff that you see or you think and really going deeper and exploring and looking at the relationship between your pain and the job you hate or the relationship you are in that doesn't make you happy or what you eat for example or like there's so many root causes to things but it really is about like going inward and learning from yourself and that when we're connected to our intuition, we really have most of the information we need. I love the book title, Heal From Within, and I absolutely love the colors as well. It's so feel good and so beautiful. In your book, you shared a lot about chakras, which I found really interesting. Could you give us a brief overview? There are seven main chakras. A chakra is an energy center. It's an energy center that includes certain body parts, certain emotional characteristics and spiritual characteristics. And the body is divided into these seven sections, basically. They go back a long way, a really long history and all that. The way that I use them, I don't really look at unblocking a chakra, which some people do, and that's fine. The way that I use them is to look at every section of the body and every aspect of our personality. And number one, make sure that I'm being thorough. So if I look at every chakra, I'm making sure that I look at the whole person. But it's also to teach people how their physical and emotional symptoms relate to spiritual symptoms. So for example, let me give you an example because it's, it's a little weird. The second chakra is in the hip area. So it has to do with reproductive organs and hips and all that kind of thing. The sexual organs being included in that, we create life using our sexual organs. So one of the aspects that the second chakra covers is creativity. Another one is relationships. So female energy, male energy. Another is career because we get to kind of our life path in terms of work and balancing work and relationships, if you will. I work with a lot of people who come to me with pelvic pain, for example, or fertility issues or trouble with their periods or male organs or hip issues or all of those things. And when 
my guides do the report, they often reveal that there's some sort of trauma related to either not being able to express yourself as a male or female. It could be sexual identity questions. It could be sexual abuse or assault. It could be like a relationship that you don't feel you're being respected in. So it's linking all of the emotional, physical, and spiritual stuff in that area so that you can say, I have this pain and I want to get to the physical root cause, but also what else can I address? Whilst we might on a physical sense think sore hips, I need to do some hip flex stretching. Right. There can be something more emotional and spiritual and some trauma or other things in our life, either past or present, that is contributing C to correct. the physical symptoms. Yep. Wow. All yeah. of them. When you're working with your clients, what are you finding that comes up more commonly in terms of the chakras? Sure, that's a great question. The first three chakras, so the root, which is at the base of our spine, um, the second, which I just mentioned, and the one that's in the gut area, which has to do with self-esteem and body image and all those things. And the root has to do with safety and security and family basic needs. Those three are ones that I think all of us, to a certain extent, have some issues with. I wish it weren't that way, but it is. We can all benefit from addressing the issues, possible issues in those three chakras. Another one that comes up a lot is the fifth chakra, which is the throat. And that has to do with self-expression. It also has to do partly with breathing. Your breath comes up through your throat and comes out. And so if you're having trouble expressing yourself, or maybe you're expressing yourself too much, maybe word vomit you may have physical and emotional symptoms related to that fifth chakra. And Katie, you can pick up on energy. And this is one of the things I discovered at a young age too. I still to this day can pick up on other people's energy, whether it's a feel-good energy or sure. maybe a dark and depressing energy. And even to the point when I was visiting Hong Kong and I walked into even a hotel room and I could feel that the energy was cold. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, whoever built this building, this is a cold energy. And I could only stay there for one night. I kid you not. Mm -hmm. I'm really good at picking up on energy, but that sometimes can be very draining. Yes. I've been told I'm more of an empath. Yes. How can one who picks up on energy and particularly now with the way the world is where we have so many world events right happening how can one protect or balance out their energy that's a really a great question and one of the things that i find is helpful is number one understanding the origin of being an empath and what i mean is a lot of us who grew up in dysfunctional homes or in traumatic situations you had to be on guard all the time mm -hmm. you had to be adjusting your behavior all the time or else either you were going to get yelled at or rejected or some other thing but the consequences were not good if you were not kind of on guard also for a lot of us we could not speak up we could not say this is crazy why are you people acting this way and when we did try there was rejection and guilt and all kinds of things so you learned to push down your own sense of self and your own feelings and replace it with the feelings and thoughts of those people around you as a survival mechanism. We got really good at reading other people because we had to. And oftentimes those people had no concept of boundaries. So they didn't respect us. They didn't respect themselves. There was no concept of I'm here and you're over there and our energy is supposed to be separate. It was a lot of you have to take care of me type stuff. Kids who have to parent their parents. So understanding that we are separate entities, that we control our energy, only us. We are in control of this energy and that it's safe to set boundaries. It's safe to say, I'm going to stand up for myself that I don't have to take care of you, that I'm gonna keep my energy here and you're gonna keep yours there. It doesn't mean I don't care, 
So a lot of it is taking back your power and knowing that no one can influence you if you don't want them to. No energy can get to you if you don't allow it. You don't have to walk around open all the time. We need to close up and spend time to ourselves. If I was open all the time to the information I'd get, it would be so overwhelming. And I used to live that way, being a therapist helped. So it's not that I don't pick up on other people's stuff because I do, but now I'm much more aware and I say to myself, is what I'm feeling mine? Is this anxiety, for example, is there a reason I'm feeling anxious and deal with it? And then if it's not mine, I can say, well, if I'm picking it up from outside of myself, I'm going to put it in a little box and give it back. So a lot of it is just really allowing yourself to have feelings and be aware of them. And then you can work them out and process them and know that you have a right to be yourself and have opinions and protect yourself. And I think a really good example of that is at the moment, and I'm sure it's the same in the US and it's the same in Australia, where if you tune into the news every day, all you hear is about the petrol prices, the rising costs of living, interest rates, inflation rising. And if you open yourself up to that energy, take you down pretty quickly. So I've learned to not consume delete the Facebook app off my phone, yes, and really just have to set strong boundaries because I know it's fear-inducing negative energy and I now know, whoa, I don't want that to come into my space. And I really believe, like, I believe in good and evil. I've been around evil. It's real. Evil uses things like fear to try to get us to not be our true selves, to not be loving, to not be caring. And to also remember that fear is often an illusion and it's created by negativity and you don't have to succumb to that. It doesn't have power over you. I learned that at a young age because it was really scary. Mm -hmm. So to realize love is always more powerful than hate and evil, even though hard to tell sometimes in this world. Yeah. In your book, Heal From Within, You got us to do this session where we had the body and the different chakras. I mean, your book's incredible, Katie. There is so much information, so many questions, so many intuitive writing prompts. It's kind of like doing a session with you at home. Was it hard when you first came out to share that you had these intuitive skills and guides and insight yeah it really was and that's why i say that the eating disorder was the best thing that ever happened to me because i had to start from scratch and i had to ask for help and i had to figure out who i was and so being able to talk to the therapist about this and have her be like yeah this is okay it's normal you're a normal person was like a huge revelation but i believe that we all have intuition and That's a lot of why I wanted to write the book because I take people through, the first thing is how to connect intuition. And then I help them to identify all of their issues and strengths, it's not negative, that they might want to work on. And I teach them all about their body parts and the corresponding emotion. And then there's tons of tools, like I teach people how to do my intuitive soul paintings. Sort of at the end of the first section, there's a blank template and I'm like, fit in your stuff, figure out where your stuff fits into this chart. And some things are more than one chakra, but kind of figure out what your chart looks like, like the one that I would make you, my guides were making it. And then you can see what you want to start working on and how it all fits together. In your book, you shared your own personal story about your mum. And first of all, I'm really sad and sorry to hear about what your mum had to go through. and also what you had to go through in extended family and friends. It sounded very traumatic and very terrible. You chose to share that in your book because it's really made you who you are today. Definitely. And you learned a lot from it. Yeah, there's a lot of personal stories in the book. It was about 12 years ago now. My mom, who was very healthy, she was 65, very healthy person, no pre-existing conditions. She got a one dose flu shot. It was about six weeks later. She had earlier symptoms, but she ended up almost 100% paralyzed throughout her body and legally blind. 
and almost died. She lived like that for 10 years in various nursing homes. I tried everything I possibly could to get her help and get her better. She had something called Guillain-Barre, which is a pretty complicated autoimmune disorder. And then she had three strokes in addition. It was a very bad situation. And I learned a lot about myself and about our relationship and my family and about toxins and the pharmaceutical industry. And it really made me look at life differently and made me think more about the chemicals that we're exposed to every day and how those impact us and how different laws apply to vaccines than they do other drugs. And I really want to state that I fully believe everybody should have a choice. I don't ever want to tell someone what to do. That's not my right. It's not my role. But we should be given more information about pharmaceuticals in general, about chemicals in general. Teflon, great example. We're just not given adequate information about what these things can possibly do to us. And if you're in a situation where you're losing your job because you have to have a chemical put in your body, I mean, I don't want to get preachy about all that because again, yeah. it's a weird decision, what you should do. It really opened my eyes and she did finally pass away so about, like two or three years ago. I hit all blurs, which was merciful because she was just living in a horrible, painful, awful state. And I tried to look at all the positives that did come from it and how we had time together that we didn't have before because, you know, she was in a bad marriage. So we got to have some very real conversations and learned a lot about myself, things I didn't know. It was like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. That explains a lot of things and, and stuff. I think a lot of people with COVID, for example, with people dying and then having to make these choices and and making choices like without knowing a ton of information. And I'm not just talking about vaccines, just the whole thing I think is so scary. And a lot of people still have post COVID anxiety. They mm. talk to me all the time about they lost their job or they had to be by themselves alone with their thoughts. And that's terrifying. And what if something like this happens again? It never happened before. So they don't feel in control. And there's so many issues related to this and grief. Mm. And part of it we lost a lot of things you know and I'm so sorry to hear about what happened to your mom what shocked me I think was that compensation most people don't even get to go through that process most cases are denied most people don't get to go before the courts that was an exception to the rule and it's because we had to have so much proof and I worked my butt off getting her that lawyer and getting her into court and all that kind of stuff but it was really hard and they really fight you every step of the way. And, and that's mm -hmm. not the way it should be. And were you more determined to go through that process because you felt it was important for your mum? Did you feel just out of principle? Yeah, it was definitely two purposes. She had good health insurance. We were very fortunate, but it's still so many other expenses, especially if you wanted the best care. So there was a practical nature to it for sure. But I also, I tend to be a fighter. Yeah. Um, and I just felt like that was the right thing to do also. You know, my mom was a nurse. She was a nursing professor. And I promised her that I would continue to tell her story and people can do with it what they want. Yeah. You know, and I actually did get a COVID shot. I was nervous about it, but I did. And, and that was my choice and that's fine. But it's just made me think a lot more about beauty products and I'm just so much more organic now with stuff than I was before. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you shared your mum's story in honour of her and thank you for sharing your mum's story here today because that was something you didn't expect to happen and it reminded me how in life we can be going along and everything's good and then all of a sudden, boom, for An sure. event happens, trauma triggers and stress and anxiety and grief and everything. And Katie, sadly, when your mum passed, what were some things that you did to work through the grief? The condition that she was in, I think that a lot of people kind of did their grieving early on because she wasn't herself anymore. I think I had been working through that for a long time. And one of the things I felt was just kind of relief for her that she wasn't living in pain and hell anymore, that she could be with my grandparents who had passed. And I talked to her all the time. I mean, her and my grandparents are some of my guides. I wow. really want people to know you don't need to be a medium 
to connect to your loved ones in spirit, they want to talk to you way more than they want to talk to us mediums. Like people normally doubt, like, I'm not a medium. This isn't real. I can't really talk to them. You can. And all of those signs, they're real. Like, don't doubt them. They can hear you talk. They're with you all the time. So they don't really fully leave. And they're able to be around you even more now than they were in life because they're with you all the time. My background as a medium and doing the spiritual work that I do really helped a lot with that. Actually, in my book, there's techniques in there that I teach that you can use to connect to loved ones in spirit. And you can write to them and have them write back. You can just have conversations in your head. I used to look for sea glass. I don't have as much where I live now, unfortunately. When I'd be on the beach, I'd ask to find like a certain color of sea glass or a certain shaped shell, or you can ask for signs or butterflies or whatever. They really do respond. Sometimes it is just a thought in our head that comes back, like we're having a conversation and it's real. And your clients must be totally blown away when you give them this report. That was one of the things in your book when I was reading different client stories, how you got a lowdown on what was going on in their life. I was like, oh my goodness. It's pretty wild. Wow. Everybody's always like, oh my God, do you know me already? This is really crazy. And I've had some not very nice people say, well, you can look it up on Google or you can go on their social media or whatever. And the reality is the information that my guides bring up is so incredibly personal. It's not stuff people post about, you know, yeah. there's like a hundred pieces of information on the report on average. It's definitely wild. When it came to writing your book, how did you fit this in? How was the writing process? 10 years ago, I found out I had Lyme disease. I'd had it since I was a kid and I grew up next to Lyme, Connecticut. I like to talk to my symptoms and normalize them as talk to them like they're friends instead of being afraid. So I talked to the Lyme and it said, if you want to heal this, it's time to write the proposal for your book that you've been putting off for 30 years. So I was like, Okay. Didn't know where to start. Did not consider myself a writer. I was just like, I better go online and look up how to do a proposal and took tons of notes. And I don't know how many proposals we had. There were so many. Luckily, we found an agent. But even when I started working with St. Martin's Press, who's my publisher, the book went through so many revisions based on their input, which thank you, God. That was super helpful. But it took like three years, the whole process. Most of the problem is that there was so much in my head and so much experience and so much I wanted to write about that I couldn't sort it out in a little ADD in there. But it was just so hard to sort out. So having an editor and people helping me was like essential because that was very overwhelming. Has it been super exciting to see your book launched? We're here today talking about it. I'm here in Australia. We're on a mental health book podcast show. It's been really a little bit crazy. It doesn't always feel real. I had an event in London a couple of weeks ago, which a book launch. It was the biggest metaphysical bookstore, oldest one in London. I was like, how is this all happening? But it's super cool. I'm just very, very grateful and thankful. And, you know, people have written me nice reviews and the feedback I get is amazing. So it just has made all the hard work worth it. And hopefully I can write more books. When you're working through the chakras with your clients or in your book, you started from reverse. Yes. Why is that? The chart's usually listed from root, which is the first one, up to the crown, which is the top of your head. The crown chakra, it's a representation of kind of like the whole person. It's the person overall, mentally, um, emotionally, and spiritually. I like to start tuning in that way to get a feel for maybe what the person's most significant issues are what they want to work on the most, kind of the glaring stuff, the life-threatening stuff, why they initially wanted to come work with me. So it's a way to tune into the whole person. And then the rest of the chakras break down all of the different body parts and issues. And that way I can get more specific as I get more into it. Thank you for explaining that. So how do you look after yourself and what are some of your own self-care rituals? One of my most important is movement. You can see the pole behind me. Actually, so I can. I am an avid pole dancer, pole sport. I go to class maybe six to eight hours a week and then I have the pole here. And I really feel like movement that you enjoy that helps you connect with your body and your spirit and helps relieve stress. Like, you know, you can just get out all your frustrations or whatever with movement. When I found something that I loved, 
it's no longer a chore. It helped me feel better about my body because having an eating disorder background, there's body dysmorphia stuff. These beliefs, it's very important to me that I do things for self-love and self-care. Movement is definitely one of them. I'm pretty careful about what I eat. I'm not restrictive. If I want something, I'll have it. I'm pretty organic. I don't do well with gluten and dairy. I try to avoid chemicals in my life. Talk to my guides, spirit, intuition on pretty much a daily basis, if not more than that, to help me ground and center. I only see a limited amount of clients each week because I know that you can easily get overwhelmed, especially with what I do. So I put limits on that and set boundaries. I have an amazing husband and two amazing grown children. So they're a huge priority and I make sure that I get time with them. A lot of it's just trying to be as aware as possible about what I'm feeling, what I need, where I'm coming from, so that if issues arise, I can address them as quickly as possible. Do you still use writing as a form of trying to figure out things for your own self? I absolutely do. And that technique is from Jungian psychology. I didn't invent it. I wish I did. That technique, I can honestly say, saved my life. So it was learning to connect to myself, my intuition, the love, using that writing technique that I teach in the book. And you write to it, it actually really does write back. And you end up having a written conversation where you're getting all this amazing information and also getting to be your true self in a safe space. And you can write to your symptoms and learn kind of why they're there instead of fearing them and thinking that you have to just fight them all the time and get rid of them. That's an essential part of my life practice for sure. Love writing. So when prompts require writing, I was like, this is so good because I've discovered that if I write daily or regularly, I can become more intuitive and figure out what's going on. And right. it's just such a great tool. There was something in your book it was to do with Hashimoto's, and I'm asking you this only because there's a lady that has been asking me, if you know anyone about Hashimoto's, can you please ask them? And it just prompted me, obviously her guide's like tap, 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 right, right, right. ask about Hashimoto's. I love it. But it was coming up with a particular chakra. Yes. Hashimoto's, for people who don't know, it's an autoimmune disease of the thyroid, which is in your throat area. It tends to make the thyroid underactive, although your numbers can be all over the place. And in order to find out if you have it, it's important that doctors test for those antibodies, not just do general testing. You can have a lot of different symptoms, a lot of symptoms that don't necessarily seem related. It's kind of the traditional low thyroid symptoms of fatigue and hair loss and brain fog and also other things that you can add on to it. It's different for everyone. Like most autoimmune diseases, they take a different shape and form for each individual. But it's spiritually, it's really important to look at what you're feeling. First of all, you have to feel it to be able to express it. So to allow your own feelings and then to think about, am I saying what I need to say and doing what I need to do? And not all of us are writers. Words can be intimidating. So Maybe your way of expression is creativity. That gets into the second chakra. If you're a creative person and you're not being creative, then you're going to have symptoms. Also, just look at your relationships and look at the beliefs in your head about can you be your authentic self or not? Maybe you don't have any boundaries and you're just sharing way too much all the time and you're not protecting you. So that's a quickie, but there's a lot of things like even the foods that we eat that contribute to autoimmune disease and Hashimoto's often comes along with other autoimmune conditions, which a lot of people don't even know they have because the symptoms can be vague. There's a lot of aspects to it. It's really common. I work with it a lot. You can definitely get better. Sometimes medication is helpful, sometimes not, but mm. it's very common. And I love that in your book, Heal From Within. It's not just physical health only. It goes really deep into that spiritual, emotional, seeing ourselves not just as a physical being exactly. and understanding that we can house this trauma or stories mm. in our body. It's so fascinating. 
It really is incredibly fascinating how our emotions are manifest in symptoms and it blows me away. And, and a lot of people will come to me for a certain thing and then see the report and realize, oh my God, my whole life is here. Mm. We talk about things that they never expected and they link events in their life or beliefs or whatever to mm. things that they never thought were related. So we mm. do a lot of work in an hour. And I could speak to you forever about Heal From Within, Katie. It's such a beautiful book, wonderful to read. It's so beneficial. The amount of information in here, personal stories, it's so heartwarming. You've got beautiful quotes. It's really interesting, I've got to say. I learned so much. Thank you so much. That means yeah. a lot to me. I'd really learned so much. I've never really dived deep into the chakras, but what I loved was how you could relate the chakras, the energy centers, but then with symptoms from anything from fatigue, body aches, unexplained weight loss, low blood pressure, loss of body hair, lightheadedness, and it was really interesting, back aches, what that might be related to. And it was just like doing a bit of a session with you. Yes, that was my goal. It very much is that. And at first I thought, I could only do this if I'm with you. Right. But you mentioned right. this at the start of the show. We're all intuitive. We are. We all have the ability. We all can heal from within. We've got it within us. And I love how your book, Heal From Within, empowers us with that guidebook and the tools to do the work ourselves. Could you just do my PR for me? Oh, <laughs> I love it. It'll I leave a five-star rating and review on Goodreads because it's just beautiful. I really loved it. It's amazing. Learned a lot. But I'm going to keep the book because I feel like throughout my life, different events are going to happen. Right, right. I'm going to have to always come back to it. Like, that means a lot. And a lot of people have said that. And even doing the intuitive paintings, people come and get them every six months or something because we change. It's worth it to do a little chart every year or something. But as things come up, then yeah, it's a great reference. So for everyone who's tuning in, you get to do your own chart and you literally chart everything out yourself, which is really cool. And then you get to look at what's going on. And it's this amazing overview. For me, things from my childhood sure. were there. I mean, it'd be different for every person tuning in, depending on your life right. past, your childhood, what's going on in your life now. But I feel like it's an ever evolving, we're on a exactly. journey. Absolutely. Oh my God. I mean, as much of work as I've done, I will always be doing this. I'll always be learning things about myself and looking at myself differently and growing. And you know, I learned from all my clients. I learned from people I do podcasts with. I yeah. from my family. I mean, if we stop learning, we're dead. So, you know, yeah. it's all good. And the other thing is the self-love. That was a big thing for me. You hear the self-love thrown around. Yeah, I really love myself. And it's like, no, you don't. You've got no. issues there. You don't like this about your body or right. you don't feel your face is plump enough or you've got wrinkles because you're aging. And it's like there's a lot of work there to do, isn't it, with the self-love. We can pretend that, oh, yeah, I'm fine, smile. Right. And then it's like, hang on a minute. And I think the book is good for that. It always amazed me how we were born loving ourselves. That's just how we were born. And then all of the crap that happens undoes that. And so people always ask me, you know, how did I heal from the eating disorder? The number one thing that was the hardest part of the whole thing was learning to love myself. That was the hardest part. It wasn't giving up the behavior, which is what you would think, you know, giving up the addiction. It wasn't. So yeah, we are all in the same boat. You're so right, Katie, because I look back now just thinking then when I was a little kid, I'd want to be like, get my brother's tennis racket, his his trophy because he won tennis, and then get my photo in my little Jedi pajamas and smile. And I thought I was so cool and so amazing. And I love myself looking at yourself in the mirror. And you have all these big dreams and aspirations and 
you just like the bee's knees. You just love yourself and you put yourself out there and then you get to the teenager age and then or like before. start comparing yourself and now comparison is through the roof. Oh, it's so bad. Love your message. It's by loving yourself that you overcome also your eating disorder and really, that started this whole journey. It's, I'm very grateful. Best thing that ever happened to me. Now, Katie, what is your hope for your newfound book readers? I hope that they are inspired to honestly take a look at themselves and be okay with not being perfect and find love and acceptance and connect with the loving part of themselves that is intuition and that they invest the time in themselves because my book isn't it's not this quick fix thing it's not like one size all it like healing and health and wellness it takes work so i hope that they're able to make the investment in themselves no matter what that means and try to live the happiest healthiest life they can that is such a beautiful hope Thank you so much in honor of your mum today. I'm so blessed and grateful that we got to share her story as well, as heartbreaking and as sad as that is. I feel that she would be so proud of you today and your book and that you're getting your heal from within message out there. You're sharing her story as well as helping to heal the world. Thank so you thank so you, much. Katie. Now, my how can pleasure. we stay in touch with you after yes. this podcast show? My website, it's katiebeecher.com, K-A-T-I-E-B-E-E-C-H-E-R.com. I'm on Instagram, Katie Beecher Medical Intuitive, Facebook, all the places. Probably a central location is the website, and you can look at different articles that I've written or interviews and, and things like that. So I'm going to have to add this one to my, my press list. I'm so excited. Well, I totally recommend everybody grab a copy of Heal From Within by Katie Beecher. Katie, it's been awesome speaking to you today. I've absolutely loved our conversation. I truly hope our listeners have learned so much about you as the author of Heal From Within. And thank you for sharing your words of wisdom, your experiences, your story, your book to heal us from within. Thank you. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Well, we'll say goodbye to Katie. Thanks, Katie. Bye. Thanks for listening into this week's Spark Girl podcast episode. I hope you found this conversation of interest and benefit to you. In support, I would love for you to subscribe to the Spark Girl podcast show, to leave a five-star rating and a review, and to tell me what you think too. Share this show with your family, friends, and community. Subscribe to my mailing list at spiritgirl.com and follow Spark Girl or Yvette Lee Blowitz on any social media app. And together, let's feel good from within.